Velocity. It's only two years since I gave the first public presentation on segment routing here in Paris two years ago. So you'll see a lot has happened it, and we're going to celebrate all of the work uh, that has been done. Indeed, in calendar year 2015, only two years after the first public presentation, we're going to have deployments in all the markets we're working with, in the web market, in the service provider core and edge market, in the aggregation market, and in the large enterprise market. Who would have thought this two years ago when we were doing the first public presentation? We had a demo code at the time, and there was a lot of work, and we were really, really happy. Look at this quote from Comcast, John Lady, VP of Network Strategy, saying how important segment routing is for the future of the network. As we go through all these deployments, and this is only the first wave, we have much more coming in 2016, expect to see much other quotes like this. Segment routing is extremely important for the evolution of the IP architecture. I also want to underline that for us, segment routing is one and one unique architecture. It has two instantiation, one on the MPLS data plane, which is obvious, and I'm going to focus on it here because it's the theme of the conference. But we are committed to the IPv6 native data plane instantiation as well. It has the same properties. And so we are committed to them. It's obviously a bit more difficult because there they have uh, some data plane improvements to make as opposed to MPLS where it's a simple software upright and you reuse your MPLS data plane. But we are committed to it. And if you follow a bit what we have been saying this week at the IPv6 conference, there are good progress uh, there as well. All of this work has been possible thanks to the strong partnership with the operators. We co-designed it this together, and you can see it from all the co-orders that are on the public documents. The ITF is one thing, but the other thing is also all the operator conferences where the operators themselves present it on the status of the work and their use case. So it was really key to get forward. A strong commitment that we made two years ago when we started co-designing this with the operators is the standardization. It is absolutely key for the operators. We did everything we could to bring this to the ITF, and we're really happy that in only two years we have the working group document as a common team. We have maintained and published 25 documents. All of the key documents are working group status. We are already seeing the first interrupt reports, and we are really happy to see other vendors working on this as well. There's been a, a, a lot of good partnership with uh, Alcatel, Ericsson, and then Huawei, who have joined the work, etc. So we really look forward to this. A few slides on segment routing, and then I'll focus on the theme of the presentation, which is to give you an insight of what are the deployment use case that all of these operators are working on. So segment routing is basically making source routing possible in the IP architecture. The source choose a path and encode it in the packet header as an ordered list of segments. The rest of the network executes these instructions that are encoded in the packet holder without any further per flow state, neither for forwarding nor for classification. So it gives you the per flow engineering capability with the simplicity of the network. You get the functionality with the scalability. And this is really where you get the value of this architecture. A segment is a generic instruction type. It can be for forwarding. It can be for service. Depending on the use case, you will see the different types of, of segments being used. So there are four basic segments. It's like the Lego game, where you have these blocks. Out of these blocks, you can build all the services you want. So the IGP prefix segment, I focus here on the right side in the WAN. 16,005 represents the IGP prefix segment to node number 5. We assume in this presentation that the global label block, uh, the, 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 the global label range starts at 16,000. And so the prefix segment to a node is 16,000 plus the index of the node. So 16,005 is the global prefix segment that in the ISIS domain, in the core, represents the shortest path 
to node number 5. If you drop a packet with label 16,005 anywhere in the ISIS domain, the network will carry this packet on the ECMP-aware shortest path up to node 5, and normally the penultimate op will pop that label. That's the definition of an IGP prefix segment. The second segment in purple is the adjacency segment. This is a local segment, a local label. Node number two, for example, allocate a local label 124 for its neighbor number four. He advertises it in ISS to everybody or in OSPF, and he says, hey, if you send a packet to me and the top label is 124, I'm going to pop it and forward the packet to the neighbor number four. It allows other nodes to completely control the forwarding action of this node number two. This is a local label, a local segment. In the data center, ISIS and OSPF are not used. BGP is used. And you want also to use segment routing. We will have deployments in the, in the data centers as well. So the BGP prefix segment is simply the same as the IGP prefix segment, but applied to a BGP-based data center. So here it's the same, because it's a global label. It is the label block base, 16,000, plus the index of the node, so 16,001. And so in the data center, everybody knows that 16,001 means the best path, ECMP aware, to switch number one. And if you drop a packet with label 16,001 anywhere in the data center, it will be forwarded along the ECMP aware BGP best path up to switch number one. This is the BGP prefix segment. The fourth segment is called a BGP peering segment in purple here. The BGP border routers automatically allocate a local label, a local segment, for any of their peer. Here, node number four allocates a local label 147 for its peer number seven. And he says to everybody via BGP ad uh, advertisement, but especially to the controller, hey, if you want to force a packet through that peering link, you will use 147, send a packet to me with the top label 147, I will pop and forward the packet there. Why is it interesting? Look at this diagram. We will get back to it later on. The peer number seven on the right is connected via two peering links, one from five, one from four. The one from five, I drew it with a fig bar. It's the high capacity, low latency, uh, high capacity but large latency link. From number four to number seven, it is a low capacity link, but it has a good latency. Typically, if you only use BGP, it will not be used. The better transit link, 5 to 7, will be used, and all the traffic will be there. Obviously, if you want to have low latency flows, they will not have the service they want, although you have this in your topology. And we will show later on that this BGP peering segment is key to solve this use case. WAN automation engine, WAY. This is a part of our SDN control plane, which gathers a comprehensive knowledge of all the different domains of the multi-domain network. It gathers a specific and comprehensive view of the topology of the data center. It gathers the topology and all the details of the core. And it gathers also the external topology of all the connection to your peers and your transit. He does it not only from a topology viewpoint, but he collects all of these segments that are given by the distributed control plane. So WA has a comprehensive view of the overall topology of the multi-domain network together with the segments that exist in each of the domain. As such, he will be able to compute any path he wants through the network. Specifically, he collects this with one and unique way, BGPLS standardized at the ATF. So it's simple and consistent. As I said, WAE with this information can encode any path through the network. If the application in the data center sends a request and say, hey, I need to go to seven, so it means this peer, some content or user behind that peer, but I need low latency, WAE, it's very easy for him to know. He basically compute and he says, hey, you really need to go along the green path. And that green path across the multi-domain network is realized by way by installing one single state in the overall multi-domain network. One single state is created, 
just in front of the application, on the top of rack switch, or the V switch in the data center. There, at the maximum scalability, the flow is classified, the list of segments is appended on the packet header, the flow will get a service through the complete network without any further programming. So it means that the SDN control is leveraging the network and has little to do. So it means scalability, reactivity. So what are the segments that we push here? 16001 realize the ECMP shortest path through the data center up to switch number one. It is the good decision. I want to load share in the data center as, one I, as much as I want. Exiting at node number one is the good decision because the application has low latency and switch number one is better placed in terms of entry point into the core from a low latency viewpoint. Indeed, we see that from a, a capacity viewpoint, the link between two and four is bad. It's a thin link. It has a bad ISS metric. But from a low latency viewpoint, it is quicker to go to four via the top path than via the bottom path. So in order to force that low latency, first you want to enter the network, the core at one, and then you want to do one, two, four. But to do one, two, four, you can realize it by segment 16,002 and 124. That gets you to four. There, if you would not have a segment, the normal BGP table would, would tell you, hey, the best path to go to seven would be five, seven to go and take the normal peering link. But this is not the low latency service you want for that flow. You encode it with 147, and you realize exactly what the application wants without any state anywhere on a, on a per flow basis, only in front of the application. Let me introduce a fifth segment, the binding segment. WAE, for additional scale, may want to create policies only in the core. For example, he may re uh, realize that data center applications are often asking for a low latency flow from w that is end-to-end -end but crossing from one to four. At some point in time, he may say, let me install an aggregated policy. And so he sends a PSAP request. Again, the architecture is very simple. We're reusing the protocol that we defined it, very small extension to add the segments. So it's a very simple thing to do. PSEP sends, uh, WE sends a PSEP request to node number one and he says, I need a low latency path to node number four. Here, I show two alternatives in the portfolio we're building and we support both and you can do at the booth, you will see the demonstration for, bo for both. Here, WA could compute it and say to the router, I want you to do this. But in order to offer the balance between centralization and distribution, we also offer for WA to say, I just need it. You, the router, you know how to compute it, compute for me. So it's a balance between the two where you want to put the control. Here, WA simply asks, he sends a PSAP request and he says, I want low latency from one to four. One has the link state database of the core. He has the comprehensive topology. He has the segments. So he knows that low latency will be that path. What he does is that he allocates a local label to it that we call a binding segment. Here, value 200 and installed in the data plane an incoming label 200 and he says if I receive a packet with 200 I pop it and I replace it by 16,002, 124. So basically the binding segment is the key, is the entry point into the aggregated policy. Once the router has done this, he simply sends a PSAP reply as it was foreseen by the standard and says to WAE, I, completely my, I completed my job, I could do it, I installed your policy in uh, the data plane, and the key to get into it is the binding segment, it's 200. Now WE knows this, and we will see that when he wants to create end-to-end -end policies, he's basically going to use that key. So let me redo exactly the same example as before. The application asks low latency to seven. WE receives it and he says, exactly like before, but now he knows he has an aggregated policy in the core. And so he simply reply again, creating one single state, but now with a reduced list of segments. Only three segments are pushed there. 16,001 realize the ECMP to the right exit of the data center. 200 is piggybacking the flow into the aggregated policy in the core, which is doing low latency up to four. 147 is giving you the low latency access through the peering link. 
This is so important, we believe, for the evolution of the IP architecture that we call it application engineered routing and we launched the solution externally two days ago. Application engineered routing is this. The application communicates their requirements to the SDN controller. The SDN controller has a comprehensive knowledge of the multi-domain network, the topologies and the segments. The segments that are provided by the distributed protocols. So it's a marriage between the centralization and the distribution, as we said last year. Having this comprehensive knowledge of the multi-domain network, the SDN controller computes the best path to realize the requirement and then translates that path as a list of segments. The SDN control then programs a single state in front of the application flow where the list of segments is appended in the packet header. The rest of the network delivers on the encoded instruction without any further per flow state. So the benefits of this solution are ultra-scale, millions of flows could be engineered with a very simple network infrastructure. Simplicity means capex gain because it means that the devices need to store less states, so it means benefits to the operators, but also operational uh, benefits because it's simpler to operate, it is simpler to qualify, it is simple to troubleshoot. In terms of revenue, everybody believes that offering low latency in an IP network is easy. It is not easy. Very few people can do it, although it seems so obvious. Offering disjoint services, everybody would think it's easy. It is not easy to, it is not something common today in 2015 to do it. And this is not normal. With this solution, it's extremely easy to do it. So it's also increasing the service revenue, the service richness, and obviously the velocity. So let me walk through the solution with a few other examples to show the full benefit of it. Now the application sends a request to WAE and says, I, I am different from the other application. I am actually on the same server behind the same top of rack switch. I also want to go to seven, but I want high bandwidth. WAE computes it and it says, yeah, high bandwidth, 16,001 and 16,005. And it gets a different flow, a different path, a different experience, but without any change in the network. The network stays the same, a single state in front of the application. That flow is going on. Let's say that in the core, the link 126 fails. The beauty of segment routing, of application engineered routing, is that this is a marriage between centralization, SDN control, and distribution. These segments are given by ISS, OSPF, and BGP. They are self-protected. The, the intelligence we put in the distributed control plane not only offers you the segment, but by default protect them. So here, the controller does not need to do anything. When the link fails, that segment was pre-computed for a backup path that is optimal on top of everything. It is much better than RSVPT fast reroute that is only doing the same as ATM and SDH that are not IP efficient. There was a very good report from Orange last year. Look at it, you will see how much more efficient it is than replicating TDM technologies in IP. We are in 2015, this is IP driven. We needed the backup path to be IP optimized, not SDH optimized. Sorry. Thanks. Let's say another use case. Uh, I need to have high bandwidth, but because it's high bandwidth in the data center, I really want to maximize my load share. Very easy, because we are based on IP. We can have an Anycast prefix segment. The two data center at Stritch, they advertise the same segment, 16,008. The controller, he knows it because he has all this information. And so he says to the application, push 16,008, 16,005. Now we load share across all the ECM path, across the two data center gateways, and then we go through the core on the high capacity path. Again, an example. Now, a specific application needs low latency. It's a trading flow application. They want low latency in the core, but in the data set center, there are two teams. They are put on one spine plane of the data center. The other trading team is on the other spine plane. So if there is a failure, one is impacted, not the other one. It's obvious. It's typical requirements. Very easy to do. By, sing, by, in, by pushing a single state, 
on the top of rack switch or the virtual switch and creating w the experience that this flow wants. The first segment is 16,010. This is the segment gets, that gives you access to the spine plane zero in the data center. So it gives you this path. First you go to spine plane zero, then you exit from one because this is the low latency exit, then you take 200, it's the low latency path to four, and then 147 is the low latency peering. <clears throat> you can also do service chaining. If the application wants high bandwidth to seven, but he wants a VNF service at data center switch 14 and a, and a service at core router six, you can obviously do it by pushing segments that are not only forwarding segments, but are also now service segments. You can basically, it's like a little program C code, you encode what you want in the packet header. And so you realize what you want, again, without the controller to maintain any per flow state in the network, anywhere else than on the top of rack switch or the virtual uh, switch. So it gives you the scaling. Application engineered routing, the beauty of it is that you can embrace it at your own pace and at each step you get incremental benefits. First step, deploy segment routing. You get network simplification, much fewer protocols to maintain. You get network resiliency, automated 50 millisecond fast reroute, and you get simple forms of T, but the simple forms that you need, latency, disjoinness, avoidance, a VPN that needs to avoid a certain country, a certain fiber, easy to do with that first step. Step number two, step number three, you add the SDN control, you add the service virtualization, you increase the network optimization, service velocity, and you give end-to-end -end application control through the multi-domain network. If you go to the booth, or if you go on dcloud.cisco.com, you will see all of these use cases being sliced step by step and demonstrated to you. A good chunk of them are FCS on ISIS and OSPF, and will be deployed this year, you've seen, you've seen the deployment slide. All the rest, we can demonstrate it with beta code and we will ship it through two phases, one in the summer, one at the end of the year. Strong investment, high velocity. Better than this, it's a complete portfolio. The planning solution with everything, fast reroute, low, uh, this is bandwidth optimization, so uh, centralized bandwidth optimization, low latency path creation in the network, the joinless creation in the network, all of this planning solution already exists today. You can use it today to plan your deployments, to assess your benefits, not on the basis of slides, not on the basis of the use case of someone else, on the basis of your own data. So it's the best way for you to assess the benefits and prepare your deployments. Conclusion. Application engineered routing, we believe, is absolutely strategic for the evolution of the IP network. The application programs the segment routing network to deliver end-to-end -end per flow policy from the data center, through the one, through the aggregation, up to the end user. Adding value at your own pace, as you go through the steps of this solution, you, with a software upgrade of the MPLS data plane, so you reuse the MPLS data plane, you upgrade the software to get segment running. With that first step, you get simplification, automated uh, uh, fast reroute, 50 millisecond fast reroute, and some simple forms of traffic engineering. When you add the SDN controller, you then get the end-to-end -end application control and the overall uh, network optimization. The economic gains are obvious in terms of increased service richness and velocity but as well, and we are clear about it, because of the simplification you can do on uh, the architecture, it will relate into operational gains to you and capex gains to you. The deployments in calendar year 2015 are absolutely uh, great. Uh, we work hard, but it's m better than what we were hoping. We are going to deploy in all of the markets we're working with, web, service provider, not only in the core, we have a very large deployments uh, in the aggregation and obviously as well the large enterprise where we have several deployments in calendar year 2015. This has been possible thanks to the strong partnership of the lead operators. 
Uh, this has been extremely important. This has been co-designed with them, and we focus only on real use case. All what we did, we already knew who would deploy, and there were always much more than one operator that was behind it. We were committed to the standardization. We we're really happy to see the progress. We were committed to the multi-vendor support, and we did everything we could to support it. And we see the first interrupt reports, and we are really happy for it. Thank you. Okay.